In this video, I want to talk about reprogramming your brain using a technique called CBT. Now, what is CBT? Well, CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. And according to the UK's National Health Service, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, otherwise known as CBT, is a talking therapy that can help you manage your problems by changing the way you think and behave. It's most commonly used to treat anxiety and depression, but it can be useful for other mental and physical health problems. Now, before you start thinking that because I'm using words like therapy and mental health, I'm implying that you must be some gibbering, straitjacket-wearing nut job who needs to be locked up in a padded cell for his or her own protection, like our friend here, uh, to benefit from CBT, nothing could be further from the truth. Everyone can benefit from introducing CBT into their lives. CBT is based on the concept that your thoughts, feelings, physical sensations and actions are interconnected and that negative thoughts and feelings can trap you in a vicious cycle. CBT aims to help you deal with problems in a more positive way by breaking them down into smaller parts. And it looks for practical ways to improve your state of mind on a daily basis. So, how does CBT work in practice? Well, generally, it involves several steps and several different techniques that, when combined, allow you to control the way that you think and feel. The start is to identify the way you feel and what you're thinking when you're doing something. And one technique is to use mindfulness meditation. Simply by choosing not to let your thoughts and emotions affect you, you can become less controlled by them and less susceptible to your own fears and negative thoughts. Just empty your brain and concentrate on the here and now and what's going on around you. But at the same time, when the thoughts do start to creep in, you're going to make a note of them so you can try and change them. And this technique is called journaling. And what you do is you write down the feelings as they come to you, or you can write them in a journal at the end of the day. The next steps fall under the category of cognitive restructuring, and you can think of this as reprogramming yourself. And the first is thought challenging. Now, thought challenging is simple. It means that you're looking at all those thoughts that you made a note of and now you're challenging them and testing whether or not you think they're really true. So if you're afraid of public speaking, it may be that you think things like, I'm going to stutter and everyone will laugh at me. In thought challenging, we're going to deconstruct that belief and see if it really is likely or if it's anything to really be afraid of. So ask yourself, why would you stutter? Do you normally stutter when you talk? Why would people laugh at you? Are people usually that unkind? Would you laugh if someone had a hard time giving a speech? Or would you be more sympathetic and understanding than that? Does it matter? If you aren't going to see these people again, why does it matter what they think of you? Ask yourself these things and focus on the fact that the worst case scenario really isn't all that bad. Once you can start doing that, you'll see there's nothing to be afraid of. You can even repeat a maxim to yourself as a positive affirmation. It really doesn't matter what these people think of me. It really doesn't matter what these people think of me. You can think that to yourself over and over again. Hypothesis testing can be one of the most unpleasant and upsetting parts of CBT, but it's also by far one of the most immediately effective. The idea is that you're looking at those fears that you have and then you're going to test if they're true. 
Now, let me give you an example from my own experience. When I was a boy, I had a terrible fear of escalators. I used to have this terrible feeling that when I got to the end, you know, where it disappears underneath and rolls round, that it was going to chop my feet off. Or that if I was going up the escalator, a shoelace or a piece of clothing would get snagged in the escalator itself or in the handrail. And then when we got to the end, it would rip my arm off or rip my leg off. I mean, I didn't realize that escalators do have fail-safe devices built in to stop that happening. So every time I went anywhere and there was an option to use the stairs instead of the escalator, I always took that. And the more I avoided escalators, the worse my fear and my phobia got. Well, one day, um, I as I was about 10 years old, and I went up into central London with my parents and we took a journey on the London Underground, on the Tube. And we went on the Bakerloo line. And for those who are familiar with the London Underground, you'll know that this is actually one of the deeper lines on the system. And getting on the train was fine because at the station that we got on at, uh, there was a lift, um, an elevator. But when we got to our destination station, the only way out was up the escalators. And it was really crowded, I remember, and we were sort of pushed on by the crowd. And when we got to the bottom of the escalator, and I didn't want to go up, and there was no other way of getting up, though, and somebody, probably my mother, I suspect, gave me a hefty shove in the back and pushed me onto the escalator. And it was a really long escalator, like the one in this picture. And I was absolutely petrified all the way up. And then we got to the end... And I had to get off. And guess what? Nothing happened. I was perfectly all right. It didn't chop my feet off or rip my arm off or any of the other phobias that I had. It was absolutely okay. And then, of course, when we were going home, I had to go down the escalator to get back on the train. So I had to repeat the whole process all over again. And we got to the bottom and everything was fine. I you know, still had both legs attached and nothing had fallen off and I hadn't been badly injured and my fear and phobia was proved to be absolutely groundless. Now, although I didn't realize it at the time, what I was doing was hypothesis testing. My parents and everybody else using the escalator knew that nothing bad was going to happen. And deep down inside, I probably knew that too. All I needed was to have the hypothesis put to the test. And it worked, and my fear of escalators vanished. And when I grew up, I worked in central London for many years, and I used to go up two flights of escalators at Tottenham Court Road tube station every day, and I had absolutely no trouble at all. Now, obviously, you have to use some caution here. You don't want to test your fear of heights hypothesis by jumping off a bridge because you'll probably die. But going up to the observation deck of a skyscraper isn't going to do you any harm.